afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us for today's Path Life Forum titled Advancing Vaccine Coverage, How Human-Centered Design is Being Used to Motivate Immunization Healthcare Workers. My name is Dr. Joseph Kayaya, and I'm the lead product manager for the Living Labs team in Zambia, and I'll be facilitating our exciting discussion today. We'll start first by going over a few logistics. We, are very much, we very much want to hear from you during this conversation. So please share your questions and comments with us by submitting them in the chat or question and answer box at any point during the webinar. We will have some time in the latter half of the session for the audience for question and answer. In fact, I would love to kick off by asking you all to let us know what city and country you are tuning in from today. Please type your answers in the chat box and send your answers to everyone on the Zoom platform. Please note this call is being recorded so that it is made available to those unable to join us today. We are also honored to welcome Lulu Lemon as the sponsor of today's live forum. Lululemon believes everyone has the right to be well and that the path to well-being is possible when resources are accessible to all. Far too often around the world, barriers exist, making access far too difficult for far too many people. A year ago, Lululemon launched the Center for Social Impact to break down the barriers that prevent access to well-being with a goal to positively impact 10 million people globally by 2025. We are excited to welcome Lululemon as our newest corporate philanthropy partner and express gratitude for their 500,000 US dollars gift in support of science and technology innovations and health system strengthening. Together, Lululemon and PATH are expanding the path to well-being by tackling health problems caused by complex systematic inequities and accelerating health equity to all people and communities so that they can thrive. Now, I see that we have participants joining us from all over the world, government, representatives, community organizations and NGOs, donors, as well as private partners and others. Thank you for joining us. And so I've noticed that we have a number of people participating in this webinar, people from, the land, from London, UK, people from Seattle, shout out to people from Uganda, some people from Zambia joining in, yay, people from hometown. And then there's people coming in from Papua New Guinea, as well as Washington DC, Kenya is represented. People from South Africa are also represented. So welcome to all our participants today. As an overview for our session today, I'll introduce our panelists and then briefly frame our conversation before diving into facilitated questions with each of our panelists. We are honored to be joined by an incredible group of frontline healthcare workers and policymakers, as well as human-centered design specialists, including Collins Havenzu, who is a facility in charge and midwife at Fishing Camp Health Center from Siabonga district in the southern part of Zambia. We also have Emmanuel Koti, who is a coordinator nursing and reproductive health services, Bamba Sub-County Hospital, Kilifi County Government from Kenya. We are also honored to have Dr. Jelita Chinyonga, who is the Director of Performance Improvement at the Ministry of Health headquarters in Zambia, and also excited to be working with Wilkista Masao, who is the design and innovation specialist from the Living Labs team in PATH, Kenya. A profound thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. I'll now frame our conversation. As we all know, motivation and engagement of frontline immunization healthcare workers plays a significant role in addressing long-standing issues in immunization system performance. By working with healthcare workers as key partners, in the end-to-end co-creation process and using a human-centered design approach, Pat's Living Lab uncovered simple, low to no cost solutions aimed at addressing their motivation and performance in Kenya and Zambia. Today's discussion will focus on the application of human-centered design tools for performance improvement in Zambia and Kenya, but it also is about a culture 
of engaging both the human and a logical way of problem solving by identifying and prioritizing challenges experienced by the users. Additionally, the methodology uses, use, focuses on end-to-end -end co creation of solutions by engaging with healthcare workers as eco partners throughout the process. This involves visiting the actual facilities where the healthcare workers work, who are in the front lines of immunization, family planning, and digital solution development, from design and development of the applications to medical device testing in the local context. Today, our speakers will tell a story about their experiences with the process, the impact and lessons learned. And so to set us off, we are going to have a conversation around some of the root causes of demotivation and the value of human-centered design to address these root causes. And to kick us off, I'm going to turn it to Kista. As a design and innovation specialist in Kenya, Kindly share with us the background on the Living Lab's process of co-creation. How do you create these prototypes and what is the role of engaging both frontline healthcare workers and the Ministry of Health? Over to you, Kista. Thank you, Joseph. I'm glad to be here and welcome everyone. So before I dive into the co-creation process, I want to talk about, just briefly, about the Living Labs. So, um, Parks Living Labs accelerates the pace of health innovations by co-creating solutions with users. And these users include healthcare workers who are represented here in the panel, um, community members who range from parents, caregivers, community healthcare workers, and government officials who are also represented here in the panel. So now on the process of co-creation, um, our process is user-centered where we combine human-centered design and a process led by in-country experts. So in this combination, we have um, HCD, which prioritizes listening and empowering users. Well, in the in-country experts, they understand the local healthcare systems and users. So how do we create these prototypes? Through that combination of processes as mentioned, human-centered design, engagement of in-country experts, we are able to mobilize and engage users from rapid, ide rapid ideation and prototyping to iterative testing in weeks as opposed to months. So we are able to use our design skills to identify need of our users by involving them through our design process. Um, see, we have learned from our users on how to optimize our engagement from rapid feedback using various tools. This is what has led to the growth of our community of users called the user advisory group with whom we build deep relationships with. Um, we've grown to understand their needs, their interests, their expertise. And with that, we are able to reach out to them at the press of a button for feedback on these concepts and prototypes. Um, lastly, on this co-creation process, I'd like to say, um, why do we do this? Why co-creation? So we envision a world where all communities have the solutions they need to live healthy lives. So if the communities have the solutions, and this is something that we picked firsthand from our engagement with them, um, and this is where the user advisory groups comes in um, with their diverse knowledge and skills and us being able to reach out to them to get this rapid feedback for ideation, prototyping, and iteration. And that I would summarize as our process and the role of um, our users. Thank you very much, Kesa, for setting that pace really, really well. And so I'm, I'm really fascinated by how you keep focusing on the users and so would like to listen to our users on the call. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Koti. You have been working with the Living Labs team in Kenya since 2020. Why is tackling healthcare worker motivation important to you? And can you describe your experience with the HCD process? Mr. Koti, over to you. Thank you, our able facilitator. This is Mr. Koti from Kilifi in Kenya. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity as a user to be able to uh, describe my experience with the Park Living Labs. Uh, it is evident that uh, healthcare workers are faced with many challenges in their uh, 
plot to uh, deliver their daily to daily uh, duties in the health facilities. Uh, apart from this, they are also faced with their own challenges as human beings in their normal routine uh, life. Um, like you report to work, you have your own uh, challenges that uh, you are facing at home, uh, but still at work, there is a lot of pressure and you are expected to perform to a given standard. That is, uh, you are forced to see long queues of clients uh, in the MCH or in the department that you are in, uh, who are expecting you to perform to a certain level. At that same time, you need also to uh, be human enough that is, uh, you don't want to, 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 to like uh, offend anyone in the line of service. So you put on hold going to the loo to void, you put on hold going to take your tea, you put on hold uh, uh, taking an urgent call that is looking for you or someone who is looking for you for an urgent matter because you want to clear this queue. But at that same time, there is also uh, these people who may come to you uh, they are social uh, people to you, like they want to be served in uh, uh, before the others who have already been in, in their lines. Uh, and at the end of it all, you find yourself, you are pressured from left, right, center. And with all these pressures, it's like uh, there is no one who is appreciating you with the much you are doing, the, the, the complaints from the clients from each and every corner because now they expect to be served in a particular way. Uh, at that particular time, you might find like, uh, although you want to perform, you are demotivated in a way because no one is uh, appreciating the, uh, the, the uh, sacrifice you're making. No one is appreciating the sacrifice, uh, uh, looking into motivating you in a way to look and in, into your problems and solve them. And so at the end of it all, you, you sound like a demotivated worker because no one is really uh, that to, to see what you are going through and to see what solution they can come uh, up with to solve your own problems. And it is, it is, it is in this regard that they can say uh, path leading labs has come in uh, very handy to involve the user, to get to know what the user is going through, to get to know what challenges the user is going through and together with that uh, particular user, to come up with like uh, ways on uh, on ways that are very uh, practical, on ways that are very cheap and sustainable to come up with uh, problems that are e effective and efficient in their daily line of service. Thank you very much, Mr. Koti. One of the things that I picked from there is the conversation around, yes, there is work that needs to get done at the facility, but there's a human being before this person shows up as a nurse or a healthcare worker. What does that look like and how does that affect their motivation and drive to get the work done? So now turning it over to Mr. Havens, who is also a healthcare worker working in a facility in Siavonga, Zambia, right? You were a part of the team that co-created a number of prototypes in your district. Can you also share your experience participating in co-creation of prototypes? But I'm more interested in you sharing how do you think this method is different from other approaches using human-centered design? Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kayaya. I'm um, Havenzu Horins from Siavonga. I'm a nurse midwife. Uh, this uh, approach has been totally different from other approaches in one way or the other. I will mention about uh, one or two things that have been so different. One of them is uh, engaging as the, the, the main, the frontline health workers in the co-creation and also integrating of all the system. When I say system, I mean the health workers as the frontliners, the district, the province, and the ministry at the same time. And during the process itself, the judgment was being deferred, meaning everyone was free, no intimidation. You are able to, to bring out your views on the process. You are able to identify your own problems as a facility, and you're also able to identify even the gaps that you have and they come up with a solution based on the priorities that you are going to make after brainstorming. 
And uh, the other thing that has been also so special to to say, it has been um, whereby you even come to the facility itself. You come and on the actual facility and you find out even from the clients themselves, interview them, even interview uh, specific staff that are providing the services itself. On that one, I can say it's a motivation on its own, and it's a different approach than being imposed on the solutions from up there to the ground. Hey, no, you start, start providing these services. No, that one has been like, the problem has to be identified by the, those that are providing the service and define your own solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Havenzo. Very interesting perspectives right there in terms of solutions that are sort of determined in a boardroom and then implemented at facility level. And as we come to that conversation of policy and direction, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jelita Chinyonga, right? You are the Director of Performance Improvement at the Ministry of Health in Zambia. Tell us more about your key interest in HCD. But I would like you to focus on two aspects, right? Number one, why is it important to have the presence of the National Ministry of Health level in these activities? Secondly, what is your perspective on how HCD could be adopted at more of a national level and applied to other sectors of health? Dr. Tinyonga, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Good afternoon, everybody. As uh, mentioned, I'm the Director for Performance Improvement at the Ministry of Health and also the project lead for the Living Labs project at the Ministry of Health. So first, I just want to uh, look at where we are as Zambia. The health system is um, undergoing a transformative agenda in its quest to attain universal health coverage. And one of the key activities under UHC is the childhood immunizations, where we are striving to prevent uh, vaccine preventable diseases for all the children that are eligible. So as a Minister of Health, why is it important for us to be at um, all the levels where the, the HCD is being um, used? The question I always ask ourselves is, can a demotivated health worker provide uh, quality health services? No, they can't. So um, it's important for us to be present when these uh, solutions are being created because we want to see and hear from the health workers. Maybe one thing I should mention about the process that we are using, it's not apart from the training that is done in the class, the rest of the activities are either um, discussed under a tree, so everybody's in relaxed atmosphere, nobody would know who's from the Ministry of Health or who's from the health center. So everybody's brought at the same level. And in that way, it's important for us to know exactly what the health workers feel about uh, how they would want to, to, to provide the services. What is it that motivates them to make sure that they are providing services and reaching every child and making sure that they are all prevented from the vaccine preventable diseases. And then um, for the human centered design, we are looking at uh, how does it, it enables us when we look at this policy, the, the, the human centered design approach, we, it enables us to create policies that support interventions that re resonate and are tailored towards the need of our healthcare workers. If policies are developed from the perspective of healthcare workers understanding, that will be embraced. So we really appreciate and value the human design approach, which uh, was uh, almost new to us as uh, MOH. So we really thank Pat for that. Over thanks. And maybe the um, other thing I should mention, Joseph, is that uh, the process, the beauty about the process, what we've seen at national level is that uh, it involves empathy, which helps us to understand the situation from the health workers' physical, psychological, social, and spiritual perspectives. And as Mr. Havenzu mentioned, when we get an opportunity, when we do visit the facilities, we do get an opportunity to understand what they are going through, the challenges they are going through, and that gives us a better opportunity to look at uh, issues when we are reviewing policies. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Chinyonga, and thank you very much for sharing those practical perspectives. And of course, for being 
part of this process end to end from day one. And, and thanks a lot to all the panelists for sharing your thoughts around the root causes of demotivation. And now that we've set the pace around what the root causes look like, our understanding of motivation, the process and everything that we've, we've been doing over the last two to three years, I'd like us to pivot the conversation more towards achievements and impact. And in, in, in starting this conversation, I would like to hear from the users themselves. And so I'll start off with Mr. Havenzu, right? You and other healthcare workers at your facility co-created a concept called the Quality Registers. Can you share with us what the main challenge was that led to this solution and how the new quality registers helped to solve that challenge? Mr. Harenzo, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tayaya. Um, the concept called the quality register, at first we had a, a challenge. One of the problems that we identified, it was there was a long waiting hours for the mothers to, and the caregivers to receive the, the immunization session for them to go home and do their own activities home. And the other challenge that we discovered was the register were getting thrown every day because of perusing the registers every day, like trying to find the actual details of the child. So in the same process, we sat as a team uh, from different facilities, we had we discovered that we have we had the almost similar problems or the gaps or challenges, and from there we are able to to come up with the the, the the prototype after brainstorming. One of the things that we came up with was, was to put up the tag at the end of the register. A tag it should be something that you, at the corner which should be have a a name and also the year when the child was born. That is a cohort. You are, we are putting the child in cohort form. And at the same time, we are also putting the, because we are also using the resources that are available. The same tag, we are also putting a, a stapler and we put also a suit up on top so that there is no injury to the staff when they are perusing the register. And also covering the, the register book with a plastic. In case of lens, so that the register doesn't get torn in the same process. And on the same one, uh, it helps us like during uh, immunization, immediately you, re you receive the card from the mother. You look at the child when the child was born and also the under five card number. Of course, you go to the, you just go at the corner there and touch where there is a, 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 a tag. It will, be, it will direct you to the details of a child and you open there and you find there the name of the child and also the details and you update it. Before that, um, we used to spend a lot of time of flipping the pages every, just there, almost one to two, three minutes, you're flipping, you're trying to look for details of a child. By doing that, we are finding it like, it was, we are spending more time. And as we are spending more time to one child, even other mothers were waiting, the caregivers waiting. So we were spending a lot of time on just one client. And it was a motiva motivation to us and also to the mothers themselves. Because others were even uh, like shining away and saying, no, next time I will not come because here I spend a lot of time, I'm not doing that. By doing that, after we came up with those prototypes, the types of putting the tag and the, the time of spending to the register, updating the register, the mother staying there at the facility, it was shortened and the mother were able to go as early as possible. That one, it helped us. And I can say that is now quality as a team. Thank you so much. And uh, just, just to add on on the same. Uh, the other thing, it was on the process itself, whereby we are perusing, or as I said, perusing a lot of pages. And you, on the page, when you put, when I say the cohort, uh, put lighting the child in cohort forms, you have to leave a space after that page I'll give an example. If those babies were born in, in, in September, before you start the month of October, you leave a space because there are children that will come to have the first immunization, but they didn't come in, in, in September. Of course, you have to accommodate them so that you enter them on that cohort month. That tag, it's the one that will guide you that this child was born on that month, and the, the details has to be entered like this. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, um, Mr. Havenzo, for sharing your thoughts on the quality registers. And to carry us with that momentum, I'll turn it over quickly to Mr. Koti. What was one of your favorite solutions you co-created? And can you share why and what challenge it solved? Have you seen an improvement in healthcare worker motivation or performance as a result of that solution? Mr. Koti, over to you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, just to begin with, uh, the problem we had before we thought uh, together with the uh, living labs on coming up with the solution that I will be sharing on. Uh, in the immunization clinic, it is very normal in our setup here to find very long queues of women with their children who are coming to stick for immunization for their children, plus other services like family planning and all that. These women, because of the link, long queues and shortage of staff everywhere, may stay in these lines for quite a period of time. And uh, I have, as I have mentioned earlier, when I was talking about some of the demotivators is, are there in these lines, someone comes late, there are already others in front of the queue who have been in the queue for some time and they feel like they have other urgent issues to be attended to, so they want to be attended faster. So they jump the queue and if when this happens, confrontations arise from among uh, the clients who are waiting. So the staff on duty or the nurse on duty has to leave what they are doing to go solve the confrontations outside or on the queue, then come back, continue the work. Sometimes the complaints are so heated that they are also insulting the staff that you are continuing giving service, you are not taking care of the queue and all that. So such confrontations, apart from acting as demotivators, we used to spend so many uh, clients used to have a prolonged waiting time on the queues. Clients also uh, used to have like confrontations once in a while, like uh, having differences among themselves. There is also the issue of uh, dissatisfaction with the service because they came expecting to be served in a given period, but that did not happen because of the confrontation, because of the, uh, the worker leaving, whatever they are doing to go solve these problems, uh, prolonging that waiting time. So it's satisfaction, they uh, both to the side of the client uh, and, and, and to the side of the staff. There is also the physical and emotional strain that the healthcare worker is undergoing to give the service. And the, at the end of the day, the healthcare worker leaves very exhausted. So uh, the Chanjo uh, ticketing. Hello, um, Mr. Koti. I think um, we are losing you maybe because of connection issues, um, but thanks a lot for sharing some of those uh, perspectives. Hi, Mr. Koti, can you get me? Okay, great. So it, it seems Mr. Koti uh, is struggling. Is one prior? Okay, great. Hi, Mr. Koti, can you get me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Hello? Okay, great. Um, seems Mr. Koti is struggling with this connection. Uh, we can, um, and thanks a lot, Mr. Koti, for Are sharing. Are you able to hear me? Yes, Mr. Koti, we can hear you, but your connection seems to be really bad. Hello? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Please, you can go ahead. Yeah, so I was saying uh, one of the solutions that now came about was the change of ticketing. Uh, borrowed from some of the institutions like banks and all that where now when a client comes for this immunization, uh, after triaging, knowing that they are going in for immunization, they will be given a numbered ticket. Uh, this runs in the whole mother-child welfare clinic, but uh, 
uh, they are color coded. Like if the client was going for family planning, they will get a green card with number one, number two, number three, serialized in that manner. And uh, those who are going for immunization, they will get like a, a blue ticket, uh, numbered one, two, three. These tickets are reusable, so they will be handed over at registry. So the client number one will be holding their card number one so that uh, the healthcare provider just calls out the name, uh, calls out the number of client they want to attend to. So if you are number one, you will go in as, as number one to be attended first. And the, after you attended, then the healthcare worker calls on for num number two. This can also happen in some areas where you have audios, maybe uh, using an audio uh, uh, a media to, to announce the number or uh, uh, it can just be called by the healthcare worker who is in, in that room. And so you walk in with your number and you attended. And after attendi uh, attending to you, the healthcare worker collects the card to recycle it back uh, for use the next day so that uh, you are able now to control the queue. Now with this, uh, having uh, this in mind, because the cards, the production of the cards is very, uh, low in cost, uh, but uh, once you have the card, someone else without a card cannot come in unless they undergo the same process of triage and getting the card at the registry so that they can now sit on the queue waiting for that. Then it means that no one else now can come in without uh, hearing the calling of their numbers. So in this case, they are in, uh, in this way then, uh, it is a very effective way of controlling the queue without having to argue with anyone. And now the healthcare worker is left with ample time to concentrate on service delivery instead of being moving from uh, uh, one place to another, trying to solve conflicts among the healthcare givers. And you will realize now with this, the healthcare worker uses less time to attend to a longer queue because no confrontations and the queue is flowing smoothly. The healthcare workers also is relieved of that uh, strain of uh, having to be emotionally confronted by the clients. So they are also feeling like they are relieved of, uh, of, of, of such stresses. And so they are motivated to work even better giving the service they ought to give. Thank you very much, Mr. Kote for sharing that amazing how a solution as simple as that can sort of uh, facilitate healthcare worker motivation. And so um, even as we are uh, drawing closer to the end of our panel discussion and opening, opening it up for broader questions, I would like to turn it over to Kista to quickly share in terms of how many solutions did the Living Labs Initiative co-create across Zambia and Kenya? And then can you also speak to what impact have you observed so far? And can you also speak a bit more in terms of what you're observing around uptake of the co-created solutions? Over to you, Kista. Thank you, Joseph. Um, diving in quickly, uh, we've created, we've co-created around 290 solutions across Kenya and Zambia. And even though Living Labs was a learning grant um, to begin with, and adoption of solutions was not part of the objectives, as you've heard from the healthcare providers, the demand for change was really high at facility levels. We had healthcare workers take up solutions like they've described today. Um, after co-creation and afterwards give us feedback on how positively it, it was influencing their motivation. Um, and hopefully we'll get to learn more about uh, some of these solutions um, moving forward. We've seen the adoption of 79 solutions across Kenya and Zambia in 46 facilities total. Um, and these solutions have addressed 16 workplace challenges that have led to the demotivation of these healthcare providers in those facilities. Um, these demotivating factors have also been highlighted in uh, an insights explorer uh, that has categorized them using the hierarchy of needs. Um, you'll be able to find the demotivating factors. Some of these, some of them have been shared here. Uh, they have been linked to titles like basic needs, uh, demotivating factors, and the individual's needs, etc. So these demotivating factors have also been linked to co-created solutions. And as they've described, uh, each one of these adopted solutions or the solutions discussed during cooperation sessions have led to their improvement of motivation at their workplace. Uh, without 
an extra nudge from anyone, they've been able to go ahead and take um, use of this simple local solution within their facility to improve their productivity. Um, in as much as we haven't done a rigorous and structured evaluation of the impacts of these adopted concepts, there is numerous feedback that we continue hearing through these sessions um, about the impact um, and the positive um, influence these solutions have brought um, to healthcare workers in facilities. Thank you very much, Kista. And then quickly turning it over to Dr. Chinyonga, um, who has served as a Living Labs partner in Zambia for some time, actually from the start of the Living Labs project to date, Dr. Chinyonga, you've been part of all the activities. What advice would you give to Living Labs team to improve our process and sustainability of solutions? And if at all there were other organizations that were interested in engaging healthcare workers and other public health stakeholders to design and test innovations that increase healthcare worker capacity and advance health equity, what would you tell them about partnering with Living Labs and or using HCG to address these priorities? Um, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. So what advice would we give? As a, a Minister of Health, I think what we've learned is a lot and we are willing to share that advice. I think one of the key issues that we've learned is that you need a motivated workforce to provide quality health services. And you can only do that by engaging the providers themselves. So that is the advice that I'd give to anybody that wants to do something nothing without the health workers will work. So it's very, very important that we engage the, the health workers in throughout the process, problem identification to, to problem solving and all the solutions. And then the other advice that they'll give is that um, working with uh, going to the grassroots level helps you understand more of what they are going through. And you see it's different from when you get the reports, but when you get to the grassroots level, you see more and you hear more because when you are getting reports, it's probably done by one person. But when you go to the grassroots level, you have a team of them and you're listening to different versions of what they are saying. And then um, also as we go to the national level, we feel that that motivates the health, uh, sorry, when we go to the lower levels, we feel that that motivates the health workers because for somebody from national level to go to the lower level really, makes them feel important and also they open up and develop trust in the, the people at the national level. So it's also important there to employ the skills of listening and observing. So it's very, very important that we listen and observe and see what they are doing at their health facility level. So what advice? I'll just say that for us as MOH Zambia, we've not only, we've uh, maybe gone a little bit further we are using the HCD approach to look at another pro, uh, program that is involving um, immunization and uh, family planning for, for postnatal mothers. So I think it's something that we need, we can um, ask the other partners and we are trying as much as possible to see if we can uh, advocate for other partners to adopt the human-centered design approach because of uh, the results that we're already seeing, as I mentioned earlier, a motivated health force makes a difference in providing the health services. Over. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, to all our panelists for that active mm -hmm. um, and engaging conversation. And at this particular time, I know that we are pressed for time. I'd like to open it up to the, to the, to the participants to send through their questions. I've seen there are some questions coming in through the chat and we will definitely um, be sending them over to uh, appropriate participants on the panel. And for those that need additional feedback, we'll definitely indicate so that we can still share feedback even via email. And so- um, the Sorry, Joseph, can I just say something before you, we go to the, the, one of the other things that I would have loved to see, if I had a way, I would want, I would love to see the human-centered design approach integrated into the training curriculums of different cadres. I think that's my last lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chinyonga. Yeah, I've seen that there is a question in the chat actually uh, targeted to you, uh, Dr. Chinyonga. 
can you um, go uh, can you go further for human centered approach how it is initiated and what are the challenges um i uh, so dr chinyonga i think this question is around the hcd approach how it is initiated in zambia and what could have been the challenges any thoughts on that so on the initiation i think uh, we are working um, as noted we are working with path so what we are looking at, uh, the may, one of the major activities, the first activity that we started was, was trying to look at the health workers motivation in immunization program. So the process is, uh, the first uh, uh, step is to involve the health workers just to find out from them what they feel about immunization and what are the challenges, what are the barriers and what they would like to do. Then after that, we have a workshop where we meet and sit with them and they, the, one of the key steps in the workshops is the brainstorming. Brainstorming is very, very critical because you get a lot of ideas. So the health workers bring in a lot of ideas with, as, as a national level, we only guide them on policy issues, but all the ideas are brought out by the health workers themselves. And then after that, they will prioritize with 101 ideas. It's not possible to implement all of them. So they'll prioritize and they look at what are the high impact interventions that will give them good results. Is there anything else I should have answered? Um, and then really after that, we go into the, uh, the co-creation and the testing of the prototypes. We go with them in the facilities to do the testing of the, the prototypes. And this involves, a, it's not the people that come for the workshop, but this involves um, most of the staff at the health centers that are involved in the immunization activities. Okay, Is there great. anything else I should have answered? I think that's about it, Dr. Tinyonga. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, um, the, there are a number of questions coming in through the q and A. I've noticed that there is a question around whether or not policymakers and HCD specialists have ever come into a facility to find users have created their own solutions to problems first by only those users, but users at other facilities. What happens in such instances? I ask this because NHS in Britain has a dedicated clearing ground online for users to submit problems and solutions, which seems nifty. Mm, Dr. Chinyonga, are there any thoughts on this question from your end? The chair that is talking about uh, policy makers especially. So what, what happens is when the users create solutions, um, remember it's not one size that fits. As long as it's not going against the Zambian policy, then they are free to use them. And even when they are planning, when they are developing their plans, they do develop their plans at individual levels. So we, we allow them to see what works best for them as long as it's not going against the policy. One example I'll give of not going against the policy is like maybe you want to charge for something that is free, that is not done, but they can find innovative ways of providing services better as long as the policy is not affected, I submit. Thank you very much, Dr. Chinyong. And quickly moving on to Kista. There's a question in the chat, Kista, around, um, there's a question that was raised in terms of, were there any co-created prototypes that failed the expectation? And are there any lessons learned from, from the next prototypes? Any reflections on that? Yeah. So. During the co-creation sessions, we have a session where we assess the prototypes or the concepts using the three uh, factors, which is viability, feasibility, and desirability. So during that session, there are so many, to begin with, we have so many concepts. And then during the discussion, the users are able to discuss in terms of cost, ease of implementation, um, within their facilities and cost of, that, um, cost of that concept. So during that process, we had concepts that were left behind because of either it being too, too difficult to implement, will either take too much time or will be too expensive. Um, but in that, we had a list of concepts that were easy to implement, very uh, desirable, very feasible, where they were able to categorize them and say, we can even start this from tomorrow. 
um, that list of concepts that didn't make it to that list of concepts that could be adopted the next day uh, went through another process of, so what can be done? What can be done? Who can be involved in this process for this concept to reach, to cross over to this other mark? And one of the most beautiful things I saw during those discussions is the users saying, actually, um, if we iterate this concept from this area and, and remove this factor or this, I, um, this characteristic of it, it can move from very difficult to implement to ease of implementation. So yes, I have seen concepts that have fallen on that side of difficulty in implementation, but the users have been so open um, on discussing what can be done or who can be involved to make that idea cross over to this other side. Okay, great. Um, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Kista, for sharing those thoughts. Um, there's also a question around how best can we model the impact of motivation in relation to users' performance? So for this particular one, um, I would like to get some thoughts from Mr. Havenzo and Mr. Koti in terms of when you look at the impact of your motivation in relation to your performance, what would be the best way of measuring that or modeling that impact? I'll start with Mr. Havenzo. Thank you so much. Uh, on this one, uh, okay. On this one, uh, looking at the question itself, you can read again. I want to hear the question again. So the question is, when we think about the impact of your motivation, right? When you look at the impact of your motivation, in relation to your performance as a user in this HCD space, is there a way that you think would be the best way of measuring the impact of your motivation in relation to your performance? Is there a way that we can go about measuring that and determining that if, if these people are motivated like this, this is how they're going to perform? Thank you so much. Uh, one way we can measure it is by through interviews, if that is person to person, especially those that are frontline health workers. And also looking at the report itself, it's able to speak out. Uh, you are able to even to, the coverage has to increase. If there is an increase in coverage, meaning the quality is there. And it already is already an impact is showing that there is, uh, there is a good work here. But another way you can also measure is if I, the way I've said it, by through reports and also interviews and also um, which are the method also engaging also the I think also there is also need to engage also the the community also at, at the same time, especially the mothers that bring the, the children for immunization. It's also important also so that you are able to also to get the views from them. You'll be able to measure that okay, at least now they are happy looking at the like the way I gave them an example of the quality regions where the mother used to spend a lot of time. So by interviewing them again, it, they will give you the feedback that ah now we are able to go area as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Havenzu. Mr. Koti, any quick additions in about less, less than a minute to that question? Yeah, I think uh, my colleague has just mentioned very key issues like uh, holding client interview, uh, cl client exit interview. Uh, after they have been served uh, at the end of the service, they, they are able to, to rate and say how was their experience at the facility. You will always uh, see uh, clients telling you, uh, we are happy we did not spend much time on the line. The increase in coverage uh, is, is also an indicator that this impact is, uh, is felt, but also the healthcare workers are happy working in the same uh, uh, in the same MCH where you would allocate someone in that MCH and they feel like uh, I want to be allocated somewhere else because of that, but they are now uh, like motivated to be there because the, the problems are uh, solved. Thank you very much, Mr. Koti. Um, and thanks a lot everyone for the questions that have come through the chat. And we are definitely pressed for time. It would have been great to continue having this great conversation, but we also respect the fact that people have other pending commitments. And so even as we draw closer, are closer to the end of this mm -hmm. webinar, I would like to get back to our panelists and allow them to, within a minute or less, share with us their final remarks or key takeaways 
for our participants to take away from this conversation. So I'm going to start off with Kista uh, to take us through that. Immediately after Kista, we're going to have Mr. Havenzu, Mr. Koti, and then Dr. Jelita Chinyonga. Kista, over to you. Thank you. Um, lastly, I would just want to highlight um, this about the HCD process and the approach we used, which involves a lot of iteration as you go. Um, with every county, every facility we visited, we learned so much, not, not only about the challenges um, that the users face, but about the users themselves, individual. Um, with that, we were able to iterate our process rapidly based on our learnings in readiness for the next county and the next facility. So that openness to learn from one location before you move to the next, to change your process, um, to change your ideation, to change your prototyping is uh, something that I would carry on um, in all the processes that I would do and is something very useful to remind um, all of us um, in the work that we do, learning from one place and um, implementing the learnings as you move to the next place. Um, that said, um, the need to amplify the voice of our users has increased very highly as we moved from one facility to the other. Um, if I had to go back, I would find more opportunities to listen, um, and which is why we have the user advisory group in place now to be able to amplify the voices of our users. Thank you very much, Kesna. Mr. Havenzu, in less than a minute, any key takeaways that you'd like to share with our participants? Thank you so much. I would like to thank the OMOH Zambia and the PAC. And uh, my takeaway is uh, I would also like if this concept, the prototype, they are also, they also uh, in order to other facilities like other centers that have not used this so that they can also benefit and also enjoy what we are enjoying as who have started this process, especially the frontline health workers. And uh, also to have confidence, believing in yourself that you are going, you can do it and setting your priorities based on the resources that are available and able to do, looking at the impact, sustainability, and durability. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Valenzu. Over to you, Mr. Koti, and key takeaways in less than a minute. Thank you uh, to Path Living Labs for providing a listening ear to the healthcare workers who might have not known where to go uh, to, with, with their, where there are problems. But uh, together with the healthcare workers who are not looking for expensive solutions, but the simple solutions that they own because they are their own solutions, you have come really to help us. Uh, to help us, and we are uh, we are we are we are motivated. We feel like uh, you are you are uh, real partners to us. God bless you. Thank you very much. I was tempted to say amen to that blessing. Um, so we now turn it over to Dr. Jelita Chinyonga, your quick takeaways to share with the participants in this webinar in about a minute or so. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, my key takeaway message is that I think human-centered design approach is the way to go. When you look at it, you are putting the health workers at the center of the process. And after their massive brainstorming, you don't need, for some solutions, you don't need the a truckload of uh, dollars to implement the solutions. So I think um, it's, it's not one size that fits all. So it's better to leave it to the user's facility to decide what they think will work for them. So I think the key, the, the way to go is human-centered design. If we can get it into the training curriculum, let's go ahead and do it. So that, that will solve a lot of our problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chinyonga, for those uh, te key takeaways. And so as we conclude our webinar and very active session that we've had today, I would like to start by thanking you, our participants, for joining this webinar. Without you, this would have just been another meeting within PATH and the Ministry of Health. But thank you for being part of this conversation. Your feedback has been great. Your questions, very insightful. But most importantly, we look forward to interacting with you in future webinars of this nature. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank Blue Lemon, our, our, our partner and sponsor. Also thank Park Leadership for this opportunity to have this live forum, but also our panelists for the time to prepare and participate in this session. We are definitely going to share with the participants as a follow-up to this session, a link 
to the catalog of our solutions where you can have access to some of the work that we have done in Zambia and in Kenya, and you can play around with the information there and get additional insight. And then we'll also be sharing additional links to our subsite for the Living Labs initiative within PATH. So at this particular time, I'd like to thank you all and have a pleasant morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you very much. Asante sana. Diko mokwambili.